work whereunto I've called them. Now, how did that happen? Well, it says they were ministering to the Lord and fasting. In the first century, their question was, Lord, what do you want us to do next? Where do we go next? There's got to be something uh, more that you want us to do. We obviously were uh, wanting to reach the world with the gospel. What's the next thing on the agenda? And as they asked God that, God answered. You know, we ought to be praying, what, Lord, what do we do next? As Tri-City Baptist Church, what's our next step? Uh, is there someone in here, Lord, that you want to send? Is there some other way that we can be a part? We're seeking the Lord. And as they were seeking the Lord, and I mean serious to the point that they said, this is so important, they were missing some meals. There was a spirit of revival taking place, and they knew God was working. Where can we be most effective? God said, okay, separate me, Barnabas and Paul. Now, you know, obviously, when he calls Barnabas and Paul out to the work where he's called, I mean, what an impact they're going to make. I mean, what a tremendous impact Paul the Apostle, who's going out now, being sent. And by the way, he was an apostle. But the church had the authority to say, here's what we need to do. Well, then it said in verse 3, when they had fasted and prayed, they took it seriously. They laid their hands on them and they sent them away. Now, the missionary is called out of the church. The missionary is separated to the work. And now the church identifies with the missionary. They laid their hands on them. Laying their hands, uh, we do this at an ordination uh, when uh, a church, especially if the person is right out of the church, you, you, know, you lay your hands on them, pray for them. We're not imparting to them anything. There's no supernatural element that comes through the hands of the deacons and the pastor. If it were, I'd have the deacons lay hands on me every Sunday if they could impart something to me. They can't impart anything to me, and I can't lay hands on you. Laying on the hands is identification. We are not just sending these people out. We, in a physical uh, sense, are sending them out as part of this ministry. You know, in a sense, Amanda goes over to England and represents Tri-City Baptist Church, along with some other 35 or 40 churches probably that support her. But we're part of what, she, what she's doing. Now, when we view it that way, obviously, we're interested in the work. We want to know what's taking place. You know, we, uh, I know you get bombarded, and I, I know it's not even practical uh, to think that every single month that probably, especially if you work and have a family and are busy, maybe some of our retired folks may do this, every missionary's letter that comes in every three months or whatever, you may not read them all. I understand that. But you ought to consistently look at those names when they come through the email and say, you know, I don't remember last time, I don't remember reading that one for a while. Let me see what's going on. Read it, and you'll get a blessing from it. You'll be helped. You'll see what the missionary is doing, and it'll remind you that is something we need to pray about. Somebody got baptized. Somebody got saved. Or here's a real need or whatever it might be. And it keeps us abreast because we want to be a part of what they're doing. So part of what we do with a mission uh, in missions is we send. We help send. But then I want you to know, why do we support them? I mean, it's practical. Yes, they got to have money to go. But why do we support them? I mean, God could simply lay it on the heart of some wealthy Christian person to say, you know what, I'd like Amanda Baker to go to England, and I got plenty of money, I'm just going to pay your salary and let you go to England. Now, that would get her there, and I'm sure she'd be happy not to have to travel all around these different places, but that's really not God's way, typically, of sending missionaries to the field. He uses churches, and even then, not one individual in the church, but multiple people. Because God doesn't need our money. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He could send any missionary to any place he wants, but he is accomplishing something else. Turn over to Philippians chapter 4, if you would. You know, I'm sure the outside world looks and says, well, yeah, this missionary couldn't go to the field if they didn't go around, drum up support. People are for it. They see some profit in it, send these people over and help them with their finances. Again, God doesn't need our money. But, you know, having to ask for daily bread does do something for us. It does cause us to depend on Him. I mean, God gives us daily bread, and, of course, He gives us far more than that. As they sing about tonight, we're blessed. I mean, God has given us much. But to keep us dependent, to keep us coming back and asking, and even when we send out a missionary, Paul the Apostle, the great missionary being used of God, even he had a need, a physical, financial need. 
It says in verse 15 of chapter 4, you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. Now, he could have got a little discouraged about that potentially. He's gone in and ministered to them in spiritual things. They had a responsibility to minister to him carnal things. You know, when I traveled in evangelism, there was a couple of places I went. Frankly, not very many. But there was a couple of places I went. My wife could tell you we literally got no love offering. One place we went, I remember uh, the, ch- the pastor forgot about it. And I think somebody, because we were in a youth evangelism, so it wasn't like I was doing meetings every night. He, he was responsible to take it. He forgot. And one person remembered that he didn't take one and, and, and designated $75 for the offering. That was our salary for the week. So uh, I probably shouldn't have done this, probably was carnal, but I went to the pastor, thanked him for the love offering, gave him an an IRS form to designate 50% of it for housing allowance, if he wouldn't mind. So again, I wanted him to know what the offering was. I probably shouldn't have done that, but I did. Uh, There was another place we went, and nobody just was the wiser. They just thought we, you know, just enjoyed coming, didn't give us a love offering, went on our way. There are some churches that drop the ball. Uh, Many places we went, ran a big number, gave us a low offering. We'd go to a small church, they'd give us a big big offering. It doesn't correlate. The offering doesn't matter. The missionary uh, is being part of what we're doing. God, like she said, she doesn't worry about it. God's going to take care of her need. It's not a blessing to the missionary. Now, though it may be, primarily, it's a blessing to us to be a part of what they're doing. Paul said, no church gave, but ye only. He didn't say no church gave. He said no church, but ye only. Evidently, a bunch of other churches missed out. But Paul didn't. God used the Philippian church to give to him. He didn't say no church gave to me and I was destitute. He's just making the point that you were part of what God did, even though you weren't there. No church communicated with me concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent once and again unto my necessity. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. He said, it's not because I need the money. I'm not excited that you did this because if you hadn't, frankly, God could have used somebody else. He says, I'm glad that it happened because you're going to be rewarded along with me in the work. You know why it's exciting that we can support missionaries and be part of what they're doing is we literally are partaker of their ministry. We're part of it in our prayer, in our support, in what we do. I'm not taking for granted the fact that God has given us some opportunities to help missionaries with projects. and with those, We look for those opportunities. We look for projects. We look for places and ways to help because we know it's a blessing to us to be able to give. It's a blessing to be a part of what the Lord is doing. You know, sometimes we even have small projects. And, and with the mission budget that we have, we've discussed this before um, as deacons and with the deacons and so forth. We thought, you know, it'd be a lot more convenient if we had, you know, a small project and nobody in the church would mind, a couple of thousand dollars, whatever it is, you know, a project comes up, missionary calls, we got to have a business meeting. You know, it takes a couple of weeks to do that. There's a little bit of a process. So we thought, well, we could just go ahead, set a policy that if it's X amount, we'll handle it. But then we said, well, no. The church will get a blessing from knowing that they've heard what we've done. Let's bring it up. It takes a couple of weeks to have a business meeting. They'll know we're doing it, and we're able to help in this way. And so it, it, that's, it, it, it's a part of what we're doing. It's a blessing to know that we're part of it because he says in verse 18, I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable well-pleasing to God. Now, you know, I didn't preach this before I took the offering because I'm not trying to uh, gain giving or gain an offering. He's saying here that this gift was a, like a sacrifice of incense likened unto the Old Testament. When Noah burnt the incense, it pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is Jesus in us demonstrating it in a way where it's sacrificial and financial. And he says it meant something to the Lord. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You know, aren't we really in a way 
We're supposed to be good stewards. There's other factors involved. I understand that. But in a sense, what God gives us, we're really just shifting his funds around. When we have a need, he gives to us. Then we are good stewards, and when the need arises, we give to him. You say, well, why didn't God just give you your part and give you your part? It's kind of like Christmas presents. Don't we just swap money at Christmas? Somebody gave you a Christmas present, and you bought them an identical one. Y'all could have just gone off and bought your own skill saw and dress. You swap, but the whole idea was the giving, right? I went, it meant something, we did something for you. And that's really, God wants us to experience being a blessing and getting a blessing. And he says he's going to supply the need. So we support missionaries not because it's convenient, but because it's biblical. We believe God would have us be a part of what takes in worldwide evangelism. So Amanda, you've been a blessing to us to to remind us tonight of what God is doing over in England. Let's go ahead and close tonight in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you tonight for the opportunity we have to be in this service. We thank you for letting us hear tonight about Amanda's work and how you're working over in England. We pray you continue to be an encouragement to her. Help us tonight as we leave to be a blessing to one another. And I pray that everything we do would honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. 592 is going to be our closing song. Let's stand. I love to tell the story. If you need a book, it's 592. We'll stand, sing that first stanza and we'll be dismissed. I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory. Of Jesus and his love, I love to tell the story because I know it is true. It satisfies my longing as nothing else can do. I love to tell the story. and his love.